for the probably the next half of the talk, we are going to go um, look at the three major groups within the cactus family, the very basal Pereschioidea, the opuntioids, the prickly pears, and then the ball and barrel cactus, we're going to kind of focus in the, in the Cactoidea, we're going to focus in the tribe Cactea, maybe one or two others. And then we're going to um, look at the Hylocerea separately because they have some very unusual anatomical features that I want to point out. Um, so we'll start off here with the most basal cacti, the Pereschioidea. So here we have uh, uh, maybe a lesser well-known member of the group, uh, Moena here, we're going to look at the anatomy of that. Uh, this was a beautiful plant about uh, three feet across. Um, but we'll start off with the better known um, or member of this group, just the genus Pereschia, uh, commonly regarded as the most um, kind of the basal sort of cactus form. And here we have Pereschia culiata, uh, just a little section of stem we're going to look at a little bit of the morphology of the stem first so we can better interpret some of the anatomical features. So first, obviously, we have the stem. And then coming out of that stem, we have a leaf. And then between the leaf and the stem, we have an, what's called an aerial. And coming from that aerial, we have two spines. So in order to understand what's going on here, we will turn to this drawing. Here, once again, we have our stem. We have our leaf, but we're going to split the leaf into two different parts. At the base, we have the leaf base. This isn't really visible or relevant to Preschia, but it will come in more relevance later on. Um, and then we have the leaf blade, which is the main photosynthetic part of the leaf. And then between the leaf and the stem, we have the leaf axle. And then within that, we have, like I said before, kind of like a mini apical meristem an axillary meristem. And in cacti, this is modified into what's called an aerial. So we will talk about what an aerial is here because they are very important to the cactus family considering that cacti are the only plant family that has aerials. And they are basically compressed shoots or stems formed from axillary buds. Consist of a whirl of modified leaves or spines. So you can see here's a regular plant. We've got a shoot with a growing point. This is kind of a bird's eye view downwards onto the shoot. We've got a, uh, a meristem, a growing point in the center, surrounded by a whirl of leaves. And in Pereschia here, that meristem has moved slightly upwards, and those leaves are modified into these defensive structures called spines. And then, of course, from this meristem, we can get either a branch, we can get nectaries, we can get uh, flowers, etc. So now that we've introduced an aerial, we'll, we'll spend some time here. We'll kind of switch gears back to some stem anatomy. This is a, a beautiful section here of a Pereschia aculeata stem. So there's a lot going on here, but we haven't talked about stem anatomy for a little bit now. So we will go back to some basic terms just to refresh our memory. So in the center of the stem, we have a ring of vascular bundles. Then to the inside of the vascular bundles, we have the pith. And then to the outside of the vascular bundles, we have the cortex. So ground tissue here serves as storage. Vascular tissue, which serves to translate water and nutrients throughout the plant. And then more storage ground tissue in the center. So for Pereschias here, I want to focus on the structure of an individual vascular bundle. So we'll zoom in on it here, and we can see the different parts. Now this, there's a lot of words here, and it sounds a little bit complicated, but at the end of the day, it's really not that bad. Um, we basically have a, our lateral meristem, which like I said, creates more vascular tissue towards both the inside and the outside of the bundle. And to the inside, it's creating secondary xylem which is kind of a long fancy name for basically wood. So it's creating wood to the inside. Then we've got primary xylem at the very um, inside of the vascular bundle. And that's basically the xylem that was laid down by the apical meristem when the stem was first growing. So besides structural integrity, the purpose of wood is, to, is basically like a big straw that sucks up water from the ground and translocates it upwards through the plant. And then to the outside of that lateral meristem, we have the phloem. And that is basically the opposite 
it um, carries sugars that the plant produces through photosynthesis, both upwards and downwards through the plant. And then to the outside of the phloem, we have what are called fibers. It just kind of serve as, as enhanced mechanical strength. You can see they are um, very strong cells because they're stained red, just like those wood cells. They've got, uh, both of these have a secondary cell wall um, that is staining red. And then we've got, um, they're very thick. Some of these even have multiple secondary cell walls. And those are the ones we're going to look at in more detail. We can see just our regular fibers here, but we also have these cells in Paraschia called sclerids. Kind of look like candy, they look like lifesavers, I think. Um, but with polarized light, we're going to change these lifesavers into mints um, by giving them kind of a striped appearance. This is an interference pattern um, that is caused by the way polarized light reacts with the crystalline structure of the secondary cell wall, we get what is called a Maltese cross interference pattern. So I think that's very pretty. It kind of looks like a, uh, like I said, we went from lifesavers to peppermints here. So now we'll switch gears back to our other member of the group, Mawena. And here is the cross section of a Mawena stem can see it is actually quite a bit different from the Paraschia. We have a lot less of that vascular tissue, a lot more of that ground tissue, both inside the vascular cylinder and outside of it. But we can see a lot of strange splotchy um, areas within this stem kind of look like a, uh, a watercolor or a, 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 trying to think of a batik maybe. Um, and these are mucilage cells. A lot of cacti contain these, maybe not to the extent or Moena does, but mucilage is basically a hydrophilic, it, it um, is attract, attracts water um, substance, gummy substance um, with a lot of sugars in it. And so it helps these plants retain water in their stems, even through periods of drought. And these Moenas are full of it, both in their stems, which we can see here, but also in their leaves. This is a section of a Moena leaf and uh, a lot of different textures going on. Um, we have kind of the, the fine texture of this vascular tissue, um, both in the center and then towards the outsides. And then we have the kind of, like I said, almost a batik sort of look to these mucilage cells within the leaf. Kind of interesting, just on a side note, how much in Moena the leaf resembles the structure of the stem. So now that we've looked at those, we'll move to the opuntioidea. And probably when I, when I mention prickly pears or opuntioids, the first thing everybody thinks of is their beautiful flowers. Um, and this one is especially beautiful, uh, hybrid by Kelly Grumman's called Colorado Sunset. And these will give us a good example to look at the structure of a cactus flower in greater detail. So we'll start off with kind of a regular plant flower here. The whole flower is perched on a stem. This is called the receptacle and it consists of four whorls of modified leaves. Towards the outside, we have the sepals, which are usually green and protect the flower bud. We have the petals, which are the colorful part of the flower, usually that attracts um, animals and humans to the flowers. And then to the interior of that, we have the sexual parts of the flower, the stamens, which are uh, the male part, and then in the center, the carpels, which are the female part. And in order to get to a cactus flower, it's like we took that stem and kind of took the skin of that stem off and then stuffed the flower down inside of it. Then of course, here we take those leaves and axillary buds and make them these little scale leaves and aerials that cacti have. So we can see, even though this is kind of a cartoon version, um, we can see in a real cactus flower, uh, opuncia, or this is actually a cylinder opuncia flower, it actually looks very similar. We've got basically a cactus stem at the base, and then embedded within that, we have our flower. So now we will take a longitudinal section perpendicular or parallel to the long axis of the tissue, and this is what it looks like. You can see that even more stem-like nature of the flower here, and then embedded within that, we have the carpal, the female part in the center, the male parts, the stamens, 
our petals, and then our green leaf-like sepals. Cactus flowers have another kind of unique uh, feature, though, which is called a hypanthium. Hypanthium is the Greek word for cup, and it forms a cup around the base of the flower. And you can kind of see that here with this um, thick white tissue on either side. And that thick white tissue originates as a fusion of the stamens here, the male part of the flower, with the sepals and the petals. So there aren't a whole lot of plant families that have these, um, Hypanthia and ca the cactus family is one of them. So probably the second thing you think of besides the beautiful flowers when you think of prickly pears are the glockids. You can see one here um, menacingly brandishing its barbed little points here under the microscope. Uh, and so where do these glockids come from? You can see them here on the aerials of the opuntiad. So we'll spend a little bit of time here talking about what makes a opuntiad aerial unique. So we'll start off where we left off. This isn't to infer that um, opuntia evolved from Pereschia, but we can kind of see a gradation or we can use this as a comparison to something we've already looked at. So here we've got our Pereschia aerial with the leaves modified into spines and then our growing point towards the top of the aerial. You can see that's very similar in this opuntia aerial. We've got spines here towards the bottom, but at the top, we have these glockids. And so let's see what that looks like. Um, in person here, we've got a leaf. Remember the aerial here is an axillary bud in the leaf axle between the leaf and the stem. And so here's our aerial. We've got um, the leaf, of course, at the bottom, followed by the spines. In this species, in this cylindro puncho, we do have uh, nectaries or glands associated with the aerial as well. Um, but then to the upwards of that, we have the glockins, which means that our meristem is probably somewhere in this area. So let's take a longitudinal section in this plane um, of an aerial like this to see what we see. And this um, is reversed. We're going to do a couple flip flops here, unfortunately but we've got our leaf here towards the bottom of the aerial, followed by our spines. And then upwards of our spines, we can see a little dome of dense, quickly dividing cells. And that is going to be our meristem. And then above the meristem here is where our glockids come from. And in these sort of micrographs, they kind of look like rockets or fireworks kind of shooting out of the stem there. Is that kind of cool? Um, so, uh, it, it is difficult when you're making these slides, especially with the spines, because the spines come out of the stem at kind of all different angles. And when you're taking just a very, very thin section of that um, whole structure, it's kind of difficult to get a spine perfectly, you know, in longitudinal section. So that's why we get a lot of these kind of strange little anomalous, or I should say oblique sections of spines here. Um, but when we look at that, we'll try a little bit harder to get our glockids um, in perfect section. We can see that here. Once again, we flipped. So now this is the top of the aerial and that bottom in the leaf would be towards this side. And you, but you can see how this is the stem, um, I should mention, not the leaf. Um, but you can see how we've got our older glockids here. We can tell they're older because they have more secondary cell walls. They're staying a darker red color versus green. So our glockids get progressively younger in this direction. And then we've got our little meristem, which is producing them right here. So we have looked at the aerials of the opuntias. Now we will look at the stems. See, here's a ostracylindra opuntia cut in a cross section here. And it looks kind of different from the other cactus that we've looked at. We've got this huge area of central ground tissue or the pith We've got a large diameter of pith here. And then our little vascular bundles kind of follow the contour of the stem. And then we've got a thinnish, um, it's still thick compared to other plants, but we've got kind of a thin cortex, at least for a cactus, around the perimeter of the outside of the stem. So when we make a slide of that, we can see this beautiful kaleidoscope here of cells. Um, we can see basically the same thing. 
we've got our vascular bundles, we've got our pith, and then we've got our um, cortex around the outside that kind of just follows the perimeter of the outside of the stem. One of the most unusual groups within the Opuntiads, and probably one of my favorite genera of cacti, um, is the genus Pterocactus. Here's a Pterocactus tuberosus in full flower, um, right here, these beautiful yellow flowers, kind of on these strange worm-like stems. So let's take one of those worm-like stems and cut it up. And when we do that, this is what we get. Uh, it's not super exciting, but there's these strange kind of club-shaped things towards the outside. Those look interesting. So let's zoom in on them. This is what we get. These are called papillae, and it's just a protrusion coming from the outer cell wall of an epidermal cell, or the skin cells of the cactus here, and they look pretty cool, um, both up close and also from afar, because they are the um, reason a lot of cacti have kind of a silvery look. Um, like you can think of both a tarot cactus, obviously, but also Areocarpus will have these. Um, if you picture an Areocarpus, um, maybe a Areocarpus retusus, has kind of a iridescent sort of look from a distance. It is caused by these little outgrowths called papillae. But the vast majority of prickly pears, hence the name prickly pear, maybe not. Never mind. <laughs> I was thinking something else. Paddle cactus is what I was going for. They're called paddle cactus and that, or as one of the common names. And that's because they have these flattened photosynthetic stems, which in botany we call a cladode. So we're going to define a cladode here as a flattened photosynthetic stem. So because a regular opuntia won't really fit on a microscope slide, we're going to use this tunilla these mini little puncha pads from the South American plant to um, look at the structure of one of these cactus cladodes. And when we cut it open um, and look at it, this is what we see. You can see it's actually very similar to the other opuncha we looked at with a more circular stem. It's just elongated in one plane. We've got a large area of pith in the center here. Um, that is bordered on the outside by these vascular bundles. And then we've got kind of a relatively thin cortex, the outer ground tissue, that follows the perimeter of the outside of the stem. So now let's take this, and uh, in order to make it a little prettier and see a little more detail, let's cut it thinner, and this is what we get. We can see basically the same thing I described before. We have this large area of pith in the center, we have our ring of little vascular bundles, and then we have a relatively thin cortex that follows the perimeter of the stem. But when I look at that, um, I'm noticing these little black dots. Is that maybe some dust on the slide? Uh, let's look a little bit closer. You can see that maybe those aren't dust. Maybe they're little, they look kind of spiky. Um, there's a heck of a lot of them in the skin of the, the cactus here, or the cell, the layer of um, cells underneath the skin. And when we look at them with polarized light, uh, they show up um, as bright spots, which is really pretty. Um, there's also a lot of them embedded within the pith. You can see they're kind of spiky, crystalline looking. And in fact, they are crystals. We call these spiky little balls of crystals druses. So here we're looking at some druses. And what are these crystals made of? They're made of a uh, mineral that we can actually find in the ground. Now this is kind of strange. This is a specimen here of woolite, which is calcium oxalate monohydrate uh, found in Saxony, Germany, right here. Um, it's actually very unusual for minerals because this is actually an organic mineral because it is calcium oxalate. Not a lot of minerals we can find in the ground are organic. They are much more common, however, in living things like cactus. Um, and so we can see a lot of them. They're very common within the opuntioids. Uh, the reason that these are thought to be in here is because it is a um, calcium oxalate related to oxalic acid. Um, it gives these plants a bitter taste that would deter herbivores. Um, 
And also, what herbivore would want to bite down on these spiky crystals? When we look at this, this is um, a concentration of these druses or crystals near an aerial of uh, one of these tunillas. It, they're just really beautiful under polarized light. Almost looks like uh, some constellations or the, Mil the Milky Way here. Um, and even as the polarized light reacts with some of these hairs, kind of we've got the Aurora Borealis up here as well. So um, kind of when you go small enough, it almost starts to look like space here. It's very, very beautiful. 